Good evening, everybody. The weird world of the very, very small. Perhaps a little bit different from what you're used to. Instead of looking out, we're going to be looking in. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a sense of scale by taking us down to the sort of nanometer sized of scales. And then I'll have a quick look at symmetry to see how it is that we think matter is made up to give us the underlying structure. And then I'll be telling you about how it is that we see inside the quantum world. So we're all familiar with the world on a scale of meters or perhaps larger than that. And by the time we get down to millimeters, we're starting to struggle a little bit to see detail on smaller scales. And perhaps you recognize this. This is an object with a size of about 1 20th of a millimeter or about 50 microns. This is a pollen grain which is basically too small to see with the unaided eye, so we would have to move to magnifying glasses or microscopes. But of course it's not only the natural world that exists on that scale, we can actually manufacture on a similar scale. This uh, set of gears and ratchets, for instance, is of order 100 microns or so, a tenth of a millimetre, and so the individual teeth on these gears are very, very small. But of course that's not the smallest thing that we can imagine people making because we can make uh, computer chips for instance and there might be on an area of order square millimetres there might be millions or tens of millions of transistors. In other words the individual components in a typical computer chip might be of order 10 nanometres upwards. So in terms of manufacturing, we're already getting to the point where we're starting to have to worry about what the world is made of in terms of if we take a piece of silicon, to what extent can we keep making that piece of silicon smaller and smaller and smaller? So we ask ourselves the question, what is the world made of? So we're not asking about how galaxies came to be and how stars work and what planets are doing, but we're asking on this planet here, when we look at the world around us, what's it made of? How can we tell what it's made of? What clues do we have that tell us about the structure of matter? So of course we can go back to Aristotle, who says that everything is made of the four elements, earth, air, fire and water. Nice and simple, but unfortunately things are a little more complex than that. If we jump forward to Galileo, Galileo is one of the first people to argue that we should be making quantitative views and quantitative experiments of the world around us, not qualitative intellectual arguments. In other words, if we want to actually make sense of the world, we should ask not what should happen if, for instance, I drop this object and see if it falls to earth, or what if I push on this object, does it move? We shouldn't be asking what should happen, we should be asking what actually happens, moving away from philosophy towards experimental science. And of course in the 1600s Newton brought this to a peak by developing laws of motion, now called the Newtonian laws of motion, the universal law of gravity, he talked about the nature of light, and what we now call Newtonian mechanics, or in this context classical mechanics, meaning how things move, how things behave. This of course got overturned in the last few decades, the last century or so, but for many centuries this stood as the foundations of physics. Basically the universe was clockwork, and I mean the universe in the grandest scale of not simply the cosmos, but everything in the universe. The universe, the planets, what makes the planets move, and how the planets are put together. Everything was clockwork. In other words, you can imagine things moving through space according to the laws of Newton. You wind up the universe, you let it go, and the universe then unfolds. But of course we know that something is amiss. Given that it's 5th of November, you're bound to hear a few bangs in the background. For instance, if we look at snowflakes, there must be a reason why snowflakes have that particular shape. We can't simply say the world is the way it is. When we look at that, a scientist will say there must be a reason why snowflakes are always sixfold symmetric. Why do they always have this type of structure? 
it must be telling us something about what they are made of. Simply saying they're made of solid water doesn't help. We still need to understand what are the building blocks that make snowflakes and what makes them sixfold symmetric. And similarly, if we look at other materials, in this case a metal that has crystallised into a rather bizarre shape, why should it choose to do that? And different metals seem to adopt different structures. Here we see a metal that seems to be wanting to be cube or cuboid shaped. So maybe this metal is made of, I don't know, Lego bricks of some kind, perhaps tiny Lego bricks, that are rectangular, and when they fit together that makes this metal want to adopt this structure. Well, if everything is made of little rectangular Lego bricks, then why do some metals decide to crystallise like that into a dodecahedron? Is it something to do with the shape of the Lego bricks, or is it a question of how those Lego bricks are arranged in space that dictate how we end up with particular structures? So we can look at things in the macroscopic world, literally crystals that we can see with our own eyes without even the need for microscopes, and by looking at the shapes and the symmetries of crystals that must be telling us something about the underlying structure the way the building blocks, whatever they are, are put together to make these materials. The argument as to how we came to the conclusion that the world is made of atoms is long and quite detailed and I'm not going to go through all of the steps. But here are some of the major players. On a timeline from 1600 to 1900, except for our friend on the left there, Democritus, who is arguably one of the first to come up with the idea that there are fundamental building blocks, let's call them atoms, that make up everything. He assumed that there were an infinite number of atoms and an infinite number of types of atoms making up everything that we can see. Some of the other players throughout these three centuries, perhaps you know of them, um, let's just go through and remind ourselves who they are. They are placed, their portraits are placed approximately when they were doing most of their important work. So from the left we have Boyle and then the recognisable face of Newton. Perhaps some of you will recognise Lavoisier. And then we have Dalton, Avogadro, Maxwell and Boltzmann. Clearly beards were getting very popular towards the end of the 1800s. So there are contributions from all of these individuals who postulated about the existence of matter being chopped up into small building blocks and wondering whether or not we could ever get a handle on that. Towards the end of this particular timeline it was mainly chemistry that was dictating the idea of the building blocks. If we take this many grams of this material and react it with this many grams of that material we get this many grams of a different material. From that you can start from many such reactions you can start to get an idea of what the building blocks must be. If we have a look at 1800 to 1900 we can see two pivotal experiments that told us something about the nature of matter. Back in the early 1800s Young passed light through slits and noticed that the light from the slits interfered with each other indicating from our understanding of the way interference of water waves can work that would imply that light is a wave. So back in the early 1800s it was established that light is a wave. And in the late, latter part of the 1800s J.J. Thompson looked at one of the, um, I was going to say particle, looked at the material that we now call electrons. Is an electron a wave or a particle? He determined that electrons were particles. When we think about electrical current, is it a fluid? Is it a wave? No, it's a collection of particles moving through the conducting wire that gives us electricity. So light is a wave, electrons are particles, and up to 1900 everything looked reasonably good shape. We had an understanding of stuff, electrons, negatively charged particles. We were still missing one key aspect of thinking about nature, and that is where's all the positive stuff? If we know that electrons are negative, what are the particles that contribute the positive part of all of the material that we understand? So although it is looking reasonable up to 1900, as soon as we enter the 20th century, well, 
things start getting very complicated. Notice this is not the entire 20th century, this is just the first three decades. So we're looking back approximately 100 years. And again, these are the key players. Their portraits are placed approximately in the areas where they made the largest contributions. And again, perhaps you recognize some of these faces. Perhaps there's a few you don't know. Starting from the left, there's Becquerel. Then we have Planck, then Rutherford, then Einstein, which, who I'm sure you recognize. And then we have Bohr, and then we have De Broglie, and then we have Heisenberg and Schrödinger. So there are a number of key experiments and a key observations and key discoveries that occurred in these relatively few decades. And I'm just going to lay them out in approximately where they occurred on the timeline. The discovery of radioactivity, the fact that light is particles, the existence of atoms, the fact that an atom has a nucleus at its core, the, the role of probability, the fact that electrons are waves, and Heisenberg and Schrödinger started to produce the architecture of quantum mechanics. So quite a few fundamental experiments here about discovering atoms and discovering that an atom has a positively charged nucleus and hence electrons uh, make up the balance. Positively charged nucleus, negatively charged ele electrons, that explains what atoms are. But notice that the second and the second to last um, points on this set of discoveries are completely opposite to what was determined the previous century. Here it was established that light is actually a collection of particles through Einstein's work on the photoelectric effect. It's also established that electrons are actually waves because they interfere with each other much like it was thought light did in the previous century. So having established that light is a wave and electrons are particles, that now gets completely overturned by the apparent contradiction that light is a particle and electrons are waves. So you can see the amount of confusion that reigned in the early part of the 1900s. When it comes to establishing what's actually going on, we now have a somewhat deeper understanding and we realise that light sometimes behaves like a wave and sometimes behaves like a particle. And similarly, electrons sometimes behave like a wave, sometimes behave like a particle. So yes, it's confusing, but unfortunately, that is the way the world is. We're not used to it on a human scale, because if we look at an object, we can tell whether it's either a solid object or whether it's a wave on the ocean, and we can easily tell the difference between the two. But when we're looking at this sort of scale, when we're looking at things that are at the atomic scale, we cannot definitively say this is a particle and this is a wave. It's a bit like saying when we look at an electron, well, an electron is a particle on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, but unfortunately an electron is a wave on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays. What it is on a Sunday, nobody seems to know. So you can imagine the amount of confusion that reigned, and it took people like Heisenberg and Schrodinger to start to pull together all of the aspects, all of the discoveries, all of the experiments that had been carried out in the previous decades, indeed the previous centuries, and start to put it into a framework which made some sort of consistent sense. It didn't always agree with common sense, but at least it was a systematic, coherent, self-consistent structure, a mathematical structure that explained the various observations that were being made. So this is sort of what we think an atom might look like. This is the standard sort of picture, if you like, that a lot of people have in their head of what an atom is. A positively charged nucleus, okay, that nucleus is actually made of different particles, protons and neutrons, but we're not going to worry about that. It's simply a collection of particles which have a net positive charge. And the electrons are negatively charged and seem to be buzzing around the nucleus like bees around a beehive. Now that picture is comforting, um, but totally wrong. But still it's persisted simply because whenever we are dealing with the world at a scale that we find difficult to imagine, we need to have some sort of picture that we can get a hold of. 
One of the reasons that particular picture is wrong is because it gives us the impression that all the electrons are the same. If you look at this particular picture, all the electrons seem to be buzzing around the nucleus at the same sort of distance and going at the same sort of speed, implying that they would all have the same sort of energy. But in fact, what we actually find when we measure electrons in atoms, we find they all have different energies. So that picture isn't particularly good. It might be rather nice and very artistic, but it's not very accurate. Perhaps it would be a little bit better to think of the electrons in an atom a little more like this, in the sense that they are at different distances from the nucleus, in a similar way to the planets in our solar system are all at a different distance from the Sun. But that in itself is wrong in the sense that atoms are not two-dimensional pancakes. They are three-dimensional objects. So instead of thinking of electrons as being in orbit around the nucleus in a particular plane, like the plane of the ecliptic in our solar system, we really ought to think of them as existing in three-dimensional shells around the nucleus. Concentric shells, a bit like the one that's been sliced into two at the bottom of the picture there. But even though we know they're shells, it's still quite common to have a two-dimensional representation of what's going on in an atom, simply because that's easier to draw. And it's easier to take a two-dimensional picture and look down on it from above than it is to attempt to draw electrons in three-dimensional shells. But you notice that not only do we have something that looks a little bit like a solar system if we represent it as two dimensions, notice that there, is a num there are a number of differences, not least the fact that we see, for instance, right in the middle there, in the pink orbit, there are two electrons orbiting the nucleus. Mercury doesn't have a second Mercury going around with it, there's only one planet in one orbit. But here we seem to have two electrons going around at the same distance from the nucleus. And then the blue orbit, we seem to have eight of them going around in the second orbit there. And the third orbit, represented by the green string of pearls there, it looks like we've got, what is it, 18 electrons going around at that particular distance from the Sun. So this is representing the fact that some electrons have the same energy. They don't all have identical energies, but two seem to have a relatively low energy, and then eight have a higher energy, and then 18 have a slightly higher energy. So it is not by any means a solar system, but we still tend to cling to this idea of a solar system simply because it's easier to represent and easier to draw than it is to think of the full three-dimensional nature of an atom. By looking at how these electrons are arranged, and we can essentially deduce that by spectroscopy, we can look at electrons jumping between different orbits, which leads to either absorption or emission of light, and we can measure the energy and the frequency, if you like, the colour of the light that's produced whenever elements emit, sorry, emit or absorb radiation. And by measuring the light, we could deduce what the energies of these electrons are. And we find they group into these, these, strictly speaking, not orbits, but let's call them that for the time being, because that's easier. We can see that there were two in the inner orbit, and then six, and then 18. And that led to this idea of the periodic table of the elements. If you look at how many elements there are in row number one at the top there, we have hydrogen on the left, and all the way over here on the right we have helium, just hiding behind my camera. So there's two. And how many elements are there in rows two or three of the periodic table? Well, if you count them across, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And how many are there in row four? Well, if you count them, there are 18. The number of elements that occur in the periodic table of the elements reflects the number of electrons in those various shells that we could see in that previous picture. And that's how this shell idea of electrons in atoms came to be, by noting the properties of elements, building up this table, and then, if you like, reverse engineering that, saying if this is how they are arranged in terms of their properties, it must be something to do with how electrons are arranged in atoms. So unlike 
Democritus who decided that there were an infinite number of types of atoms, it would appear that there's only about 90 types of atoms that make up everything that we see on Earth. It's possible to make a few heavier ones, and we have been doing that in past decades, but in terms of what we need to explain the natural world, we only need 90 types of atoms to explain everything. So is this idea of an atom being sort of a mini solar system, is that useful? Well, it's not particularly useful in that it gives us an idea of something to visualise, but it doesn't help us in any way of understanding what those electrons are doing and understanding the properties of atoms and why atoms tend to stick together into molecules and how those molecules ultimately make us. So are electrons satellites in the same way that we have artificial satellites going around the Earth? Is that a good way of thinking of electrons buzzing around the nucleus? Well, again, it's not particularly helpful to think in those sorts of terms other than it produces some pretty pictures. It's actually more realistic to say the electrons don't so much orbit the nucleus in the way that planets orbit the Sun, but we can talk about what's the probability of finding an electron at a particular position within a sphere, imagine a sphere in which there's a nucleus at the centre, we can ask ourselves what's the probability of finding an electron if we were to do a measurement and work out where the electron is, what's the probability that we find it here, or we find it there, or we find it down here? We can calculate the probability of finding an electron in a particular part of the atom. And hence we, uh, we end up with this idea of probability clouds, if you like. We can't specify the electron is here. We can't specify it's in an orbit with a particular radius, a particular eccentricity, a particular tilt, in the same way we can for planets or asteroids going around the Sun. But we can talk about the probability distribution of finding it at a particular point in space. And we find that if we were to map out those probabilities as a function and make them bright if it's a high probability and make it a little darker grey if it's a low probability, we find that electrons adopt these particular shapes. These clouds have particular shapes. And here are eight particular electrons in terms of the probability of finding them at a particular location, where in each case the centre of the cloud is where the nucleus is placed. So each of these are simply side by side, but each of them represents the probability of finding an electron if the nucleus is centred in these geometric shapes. So the problem we have when dealing with atoms is how do we actually describe an atom? One option is to attempt to do what I'm attempting to do, and that is to use words. But the English language is not good at describing atoms, mainly because any natural language, it doesn't matter whether it's English or any other, but the English language is not designed to describe objects at the atomic scale. The English language has developed over many years to describe, well, essentially, the everyday world. And what we've actually done is take a few everyday words and start to use them in the context of trying to describe atoms. We've talked about particles and waves, but we've already found that that's confusing, because sometimes an electron behaves like a particle, and sometimes it behaves like a wave. So neither of those two words is actually particularly useful. Similarly, we can think about electrons orbiting the nucleus, but strictly speaking, they don't really sit in orbits in the same way planets do. So an orbit is not a good word to use either. And we often talk about an electron spinning, an electron spin. But it's not spinning in the same sense that the Earth is spinning on its axis. So we really shouldn't use that word either. In fact, of those five words, the only one that really makes sense is energy, because we can talk about an electron having a particular energy. And it means much the same as it would on a macroscopic scale. If we throw something in the air or throw something sideways, we can talk about it having a certain amount of energy. 
because of its movement. Or we can talk about heating up an object and giving it a certain amount of thermal energy. So energy does mean the same thing when we're talking about atoms. But other words can be rather misleading. So instead of using words, should we only use pictures to try and describe atoms? Well, there we have a problem as well, because we know the top picture is wrong in the sense that electrons don't go round in ellipses around the nucleus. And maybe, mm, OK, maybe those clouds aren't too bad in terms of having pictures, but they are only representing probabilities. They are not saying that's what we would see if we were to look at the electron. It's really telling us if we wanted to know where the electron is, where are we likely to find it? So those probability clouds are useful, but they're not actually a picture of an atom. So words don't work very well, and pictures don't work very well. So what choice do we have? Well, one option is to use neither of those. And I'm sorry to say, the only one that actually makes sense is to use maths. Yeah, sorry. There's an equation, h psi equals e psi, so-called Schrodinger equation. If we can solve that, then we know pretty much everything we need to know about a particular system, an atom, or a molecule, or a cat, or a person. The tricky thing is, we don't always know how to solve that particular equation. There are certain systems for which we can solve the Schrodinger equation, which tells us this is the way this system is going to behave. For instance, we can solve the equation that tells us what is a hydrogen atom. We can solve that one. But anything more complex gets more and more tricky. So yes, we can write out the mathematics that tells us what atoms are doing. And when it comes to teaching students quantum mechanics, we have to teach them the mathematics of how they're going to solve the equations to tell them how the world works. But of course, in explaining the maths, we have to use words in order to explain what it is we're doing. And then we're back to square one, because the words don't always mean what we think they mean. And we have to use pictures to try and explain what the maths is telling us, such as those probabilities down in the bottom right there. So that's where the difficulty lies with trying to understand what quantum mechanics is telling us. What is going on? And what are atoms doing? They don't obey the laws of Newton. They are not classical objects. They seem to be obeying a completely different set of rules, which ultimately were established during the early 1900s and then set into an architecture by Heisenberg and Schrodinger. So Heisenberg noted as he was putting together this idea of this is the way we need to explain atoms, not with Newton's mechanics, but with this new quantum mechanics. He made this comment, we wish to talk about the structure of atoms, but we cannot talk about atoms in ordinary language. Our everyday language is not precise enough to talk about what atoms are actually doing. Would it be better to use words that don't have any baggage or preconceptions? Instead of saying, well, these electrons are orbiting the nucleus and the electrons are spinning on their axis as they are existing inside this atom, would it be better to say, the slithy toads did gyre and gimbal in the wave? The information content of both those two sentences in red are identical. Neither of them tell you what the electrons are actually doing. The electrons are not orbiting. The electrons are not spinning. And therefore, talking about electrons orbiting and spinning in an atom tells you absolutely nothing useful. And it tells you exactly the same amount as the Jabberwocky quote. And that's the difficulty that we always have. We think of atoms as real in the sense that atoms make up stuff which we can definitely call real. That's definitely real. I know it's real, but it's made of atoms. Everything we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real, said Bohr. That's a very powerful statement. It makes you question what we mean by reality. If atoms are not solid objects that make up other solid objects, they are these ghostly things in which Electrons and other particles behave in ways according to quantum mechanics rather than according to Newtonian mechanics. 
How can they possibly make up things that we regard as real, like the Earth and the Sun and the Milky Way? Atomic physics has shown that atoms have no meaning. This is Schrödinger. This is one of the architects of quantum mechanics. Atoms have no meaning, but can only be understood in experimental measurement. This is one of the fundamental tenets of quantum mechanics that says, here's a mathematical way of describing the way an electron behaves, the way an atom behaves, the way a molecule behaves. It's all about how things behave and if we want to make a measurement of the energy of this electron or the position of that atom or the behaviour of this molecule, if we want to measure something, quantum mechanics gives us a framework by which we can predict that's what the answer should be. If we measure the energy of an electron in a hydrogen atom, the answer should be this many units of energy. But the problem is, what does that tell us about the nature of atoms? It tells us about what we will find if we make a measurement, but that's subtly different from, yeah, but what is it that allows us to make that measurement of the position of this atom, the energy of this molecule, whatever it happens to be? So even the architects of quantum mechanics struggled with the idea of what is it that we've just made? What is it that we are now trying to understand? We can do the calculations that tell us about atoms, but do atoms really have no meaning? I don't like it, said Schrodinger. I'm sorry I ever had anything to do with it. So this is one of the people that came up with this fundamental result of Here's an explanation of how the world works. He was never happy with what he had determined. And the problem is, quantum mechanics disagrees with common sense. For instance, let's take a few examples. Atoms, all particles in fact, are unpredictable. When it comes to Newtonian mechanics, if you know where a particle is now and you know how fast it's moving, you can predict what's going to happen in the future. The universe is clockwork. But in quantum mechanics, you can only talk about probabilities. We can only ever know the probability of something happening or the probability of a measurement being made of a position or a speed or an energy of some particle or collection of particles like an atom or a molecule. We can only talk about what is likely to happen, not what will happen. So this is fundamentally different from Newtonian mechanics. Atoms don't have a finite size. Even though we think of an atom as being a small object, strictly speaking, it's not. In the sense that when you ask, here's an atom and there's the nucleus, where am I likely to find an electron? Well, the answer is you're most likely to find the electron quite close to the nucleus. But it it's got a small probability of actually being quite a long way from the nucleus and it never goes to zero. In other words, you can always find a smaller and smaller and smaller probability that the electron is further and further and further and further away from the nucleus of an atom. Strictly, in quantum mechanics, an electron that we think of as being in an atom actually could be anywhere in that there's a finite probability of an electron being one light year away from a nucleus, if you think of an atom being an isolated entity. And that, again, is completely and utterly against the common sense that most people would have. The third example is that in quantum mechanics, particles, and hence atoms, and hence pretty much everything, can be in two states at the same time. In other words, if you think about an electron spinning, well, the spin can be clockwise and anti-clockwise at the same time. And that, of course, makes no sense when we try and translate that into, well, can we imagine an Earth spinning on its axis once a day, where it's spinning clockwise and anti-clockwise, as seen from the same viewpoint, both at the same time? That makes no sense whatsoever, but when it comes to describing the state of many systems, we have to account for the fact 
that particles can be in two states at the same time. If quantum mechanics ever disagrees with common sense, as far as we can tell, it's always common sense that's wrong. Whenever we have something testable and quantum mechanics comes up with a bizarre prediction which seems crazy, so far quantum mechanics has always been proved correct. So it must mean that common sense is in error. And Einstein's comment was that common sense is simply the collection of prejudices that are required by children up to the age of 18. And when adults talk about common sense, they simply mean everything that I think I've learnt about the world up to that point. But if you don't get taught any quantum mechanics up to the age of 18, then you're simply judging quantum mechanics based on your experience of the macroscopic world, which does not apply when you're dealing with the microscopic world of atoms and molecules and subatomic particles. This idea of probability is fundamental to quantum mechanics. The fact that if you toss a coin, you can't tell what the outcome is going to be. It's not simply the fact that it's difficult to tell. Newtonian mechanics say if you know exactly how you hit a coin, if it rotates in the air, as long as you know how fast it's spinning and how high it goes, you can calculate whether it will be heads or tail when it lands. Quantum mechanics has quite a different interpretation. That there is, if, it, if the coin is unbiased, there's a 50-50 chance of the answer being heads or tails. Einstein never liked this idea that everything is based on probability rather than being deterministic in the Newtonian sense. And he came up with this uh, famous quote, God does not play dice. God is subtle, but he is not malicious. So Einstein assumed that if we don't know whether the coin toss is going to be heads or tails, it's because we're missing some information. Maybe we haven't quite measured things well enough to tell whether or not it will be heads or it will be tails. The idea that we cannot know, that something is only known in terms of its probability, Einstein was never happy with. Hence, God does not play dice. Other people disagreed violently with that. Bohr said, stop telling God what to do, because he was fed up with Einstein coming up with this, the world is not based on probability. Whereas many other physicists of the time, including Schrodinger and Heisenberg, said fundamentally, yes, that is the way the world works. It's based on probability. And we can only talk about things that are likely to happen or unlikely to happen. We can calculate, perhaps, the probability very accurately, but it will still only be a probability, not a, an absolute certainty. Let me describe three aspects of quantum mechanics that brings home some of the weirdness of what the world is like on the scale of the very, very small. Order matters, Schrodinger's cat, and actually seeing atoms. With order matters, there's a fundamental part of the way quantum mechanics is put together that tells us that order makes a difference. In algebra, A times B is the same as B times A. I'm sure you all remember that from your school days. 2 times 3 is the same as 3 times 2. 26 times 19 is the same as 19 times 26. You don't have to know what the answer is, you know that it doesn't make any difference which way round you multiply two things. But when we look at the mathematics of quantum mechanics, it turns out that the order in which you do things does matter. And the order in which you do things mirrors the order in which you make a measurement of something. So for instance, if I wanted to measure how fast is this thing spinning, and uh, I also want to know whether its axis is horizontal or vertical, it matters whether I measure its speed before its direction or its direction before its speed. The order in which I make a measurement fundamentally changes the outcome of the measurement. And that's why the so what is at the end there. It really does matter. Because if you want to know what answer am I going to get if I make a measurement of this particular quantity, it matters in which order you make one or more measurements. 
Let me tell you how stupid that is if you try and take the quantum mechanical result and apply it to the macroscopic world. Let's imagine that quantum mechanical rules applied in the macroscopic world that we live in. Let's take a particular set of objects, four objects, a lion, a vulture, a water buck and an ostrich. The top pair are carnivores. You can tell in the case of the lion because of the red blood around its mouth. Wonderful stuff. The bottom are vegetarians. Okay, so we could have the top pair or the bottom pair of this four. But of course we could group them differently if we wanted to. We could think instead of the left pair having four legs, so the lion and the water buck both have four legs, and the right-hand pair of objects, of animals in this case, have wings. Yes, I know the ostrich doesn't fly, but that doesn't change the fact that the vulture and the ostrich have two legs and two wings, whereas the lion and the water buck have four legs. So let's imagine that quantum mechanics applies and we're now going to make some measurements. We're going to make measurements by picking out of those four animals. Let's pick two out of the four. For instance, let's do them in this order. Let's pick the vegetarians first. So we're going to pick the vegetarian animals, and of course that leaves us with a water bug and an ostrich. We're now going to make another choice, and we're going to say, right, from these, let's pick again. Let's make a second measurement. Let's make a second pick. And from these, we're going to pick the four-legged animals. So we would expect to be left with a water bug. But no, if quantum mechanics rules, after picking the vegetarians and then picking the four-legged animals out of those vegetarians, we find we're left with a water buck and a lion. In other words, the measurement of how many legs the animal has seems to have scrambled the fact that we've already picked the ones that are vegetarian, because the lion is back again. This makes no sense in Newtonian mechanics, but this is the way quantum mechanics works. And had we chosen a different order, let's do that again, but this time let's pick the four-legged animals, in which case we're going to have the lion and the water buck, and from those four-legged animals let's choose the ones that are vegetarian. So we're now going to pick the vegetarians out, we would expect to be left with the water buck, but what we find is we're left with the water buck and the ostrich. Again, the second measurement, the measurement of vegetarian state of the animal, seems to have scrambled our previous knowledge of the fact that the animal had four legs. This doesn't work that way in the macroscopic world, but that is precisely how things can happen in the quantum mechanical world of the very, very small. Part of the problem is you have to throw away your prejudice, you have to throw away your common sense in order to make sense of quantum mechanics. Let's think about the second example, Schrodinger's cat. For those of you not familiar with the experiment, and yes, it is a thought experiment, despite some people getting very worried about how many cats were killed during this experiment. We have a cat in a box, and uh, somewhere on the left-hand side is a radioactive atom which has a 50-50 chance of decaying in a particular time frame. It doesn't matter what the time frame is. After a certain length of time, this radioactive atom has a 50-50 chance of either decaying or not. And on the basis of that outcome, which cannot be predicted, then the cat is either going to stay alive or the cat is going to be euthanized. That's why the cat is sweating on the right-hand side there. I didn't know cats sweated, but there you go. If it's possible for the atom to be in two states at once, then the atom, in principle, could have decayed and not decayed, and it could exist in both of those states. But if one of those states gives us a live cat and the other of those states give us a dead cat, that means for as long as we don't open the box, the cat is both dead and alive. It is not simply the case of we don't know which it is. It's not like throwing a coin and keeping your hand over it saying well the coin is definitely heads or tails but I don't yet know which it is because I haven't actually looked yet. That's not what Schrodinger's cat is telling us. It's telling us that if we do this experiment and keep the box closed the atom can be in two states at once and given that the state of the cat is linked to the state of the atom, 
if we don't know the state of the atom, because it could be 50% of one and 50% of the other, if the atom is in both states, then the cat must be in both states. Schrodinger's cat is a thought experiment in which Schroeder came up with this construct to show how quantum mechanics is totally against the idea of common sense. Because we never see a cat that's half dead, half alive, as soon as we open the box, then we find that the atom either has decayed or hasn't decayed, and the cat will then collapse into either a live cat or a dead cat. But until the box is open, it is not one or the other, and we don't yet know which, it is both. And that is a very difficult concept to take on board, because it is so totally alien to our experience in the macroscopic world, our everyday world. But that, apparently, is what quantum mechanics is telling us. This is down to how we interpret what quantum mechanics is telling us. The quantum mechanics gives us the maths, the quantum mechanics gives us the probability. How do we make sense of quantum mechanics telling us the cat is both dead and alive? Well, that's our problem to try and figure out how we interpret the results. Quantum mechanics is clear in terms of its prediction. What's difficult is for us to interpret what that actually means. How do we know quantum mechanics is right? Well, so far, nothing has proved it wrong. Of course, that does not prove that quantum mechanics is right in much the same way that general relativity appears to give us a good idea of how the universe works on the largest of scales. And the Big Bang Theory tells us how the universe came to be and how it's evolved over the last 13.8 billion years. But just because we can't prove it wrong does not mean it's right. But quantum mechanics has now been with us for a century, roughly the same length of time that general relativity has been with us. And nothing so far has proved general relativity wrong, and nothing so far has proved quantum mechanics wrong. And after a century, any theory that can't be disproved after a hundred years, there must, have, must, there must be something going for it. So, not proof it's right, but it stood the test of time so far. Quantum mechanics predicts results that are impossible according to Newtonian mechanics. You can have a problem and you can ask, what would Newton have to say about this? And you apply Newtonian mechanics, clockwork universe, and you get an answer which does not agree with what we actually find. Whereas quantum mechanics does. So far, every time we apply quantum mechanics to a problem that we can actually measure, it seems to give the right answer. Whereas in many cases, Newtonian mechanics does not. Rather remarkably, using quantum mechanics, we can actually build ourselves a microscope that will actually allow us to see atoms. It's called the scanning tunneling microscope. It's the third example I'm giving after order matters, Schrodinger's cat. This is how we see atoms. A scanning tunneling microscope, hereafter simply called an STM, involves taking a relatively sharp tip, and I've magnified what's going on in this sharp tip so we can see individual atoms, if we take a very sharp tip and move it over a surface such that they don't actually touch, but we apply a voltage between them and measure how much current flows, you can see that at the moment this circuit is an open circuit, so classically the current, as measured by the ammeter, would be zero, and it would only go to a finite current once we, once we made a circuit by touching the sharp tip onto the sample. But according to the rules of quantum mechanics, although we won't get a current until we actually finish the circuit by touching them together, if we get close but don't actually touch, quantum mechanics says a current flows because the electrons can appear in that gap position, a location for the electron that is forbidden according to the classical mechanics of Newton. An electron should not exist in that region. It would not have an energy which corresponds to anything that Newton would recognise. 
that quantum mechanics says it is possible for a current to occur even though the circuit is not closed. And it is very sensitive to just how close the tip gets to the surface. So if we build a microscope in which a tip moves across the surface, and here the surface is these blue collection of atoms, which is clearly not dead flat, each individual atom is a, a little bump if you like, and in this case the surface is not absolutely flat, there's a few mountains and valleys. But if we move the tip across the sample, as indicated by the grey arrows, if we measure the current at each point, it would vary if we moved it in such a way that we simply moved the tip across, because the distances are, varyings, are varying. Alternatively, we can always adjust the tip such that always the same current flows, in which case the tip will always have the same distance from the tip to the sample. This distance d would be constant. So if the surface was made up of individual bumps of atoms, we would find that our tip would move in a particular way as we kept its height above the sample constant, which we would do simply by fixing the current. All we need to do is to measure the current accurately and keep that tip at a position such that the current remains constant. And that's the principles of a scanning tunneling microscope. There's your hero um, with, in the background there, a scanning tunneling microscope. It's in a vacuum chamber because we want to keep the surface very clean as we move the tip backwards and forwards. We don't want the atmosphere to contaminate our sample when we're trying to scan it to get an image of what's going on. So the STM, which you can't see in this particular picture, is in the middle of this vacuum chamber. It's an ultra-high vacuum. The pressure inside is about 10 to the minus 13 atmospheres. So less than one trillionth of an atmosphere to try and keep as much as possible of the atmosphere away from the surface to keep it clean while the experiment is done over a period of perhaps minutes, perhaps hours. These are the sort of experiments that are carried out it's called surface science because we're looking at the surface of a material, whether it be a metal or a semiconductor or some other surface, uh, and that's what is carried out in the University of Liverpool in, uh, in the Surface Science Research Centre. And that's a, a picture that we might obtain. Note the scale in the bottom left. The scale bar there is two nanometers. So we can see individual bumps the bumps aren't arranged uniformly over this particular sample that we've scanned. The bumps are arranged in little islands, and you can see there's a, a dozen bumps over here and half a dozen bumps there, and they're arranged in particular islands. And from the size of these little bumps here, you can see that if that's two nanometers, these bumps are individual atoms on the surface. So this happens to be the surface of iron oxide. This is rust. The colour is irrelevant, I've just made it an orangey colour, just because that looks pretty. So what we've actually got here is a combination of iron atoms and oxygen atoms, and this particular surface, the atoms have arranged themselves, not uniformly across the surface, but the atoms have arranged themselves in this rather peculiar island structure. And part of what surface science is about is to study the arrangement of atoms and molecules on surfaces to try and understand why they behave the way they do. There are various patterns we see when we use scanning tunneling microscopes to look at individual atoms. Here is the surface of a particular um, metal alloy. The size of the image is about 10 nanometers. And you can see various shapes and patterns for instance, there appears to be a 10, a 10 petal flower in the centre of this particular image. But what's actually quite interesting is the more you look, the more you see. And every once in a while, you see these little pentagons, these little arrangements of five atoms that want to be in collections of five. And perhaps it comes as no surprise is that when you have atoms that want to be in collections of five, it leads to a crystal structure. It's the one we saw earlier. We end up with a crystal that looks like a dodecagon. So if atoms want to arrange themselves in square or rectangular patterns, we might end up with a square or rectangular or cubic crystal. But if the atoms want to arrange themselves in fives or tens, then we can get more interesting looking crystal structures.
Not only that, but when we start looking at the distances between atoms, if we measure certain distances between atoms and compare them, we find a particular ratio keeps cropping up when we look at the atom positions on the left-hand side and make lots of measurements of different positions and different distances, we find that when we take this distance divided by that distance, a particular ratio keeps cropping up, and it's that ratio 1.6 and a bit, 1.62. And that's actually the same ratio you get if you look at a pineapple. In other words, if you take the scales of a pineapple and count how many scales do you have if you go one way around the spiral, and you count how many scales of pineapple do you have if you go the other spiral around the pineapple, divide one number by the other, you get a number that's quite close to 1.62. Not necessarily exactly right. But you also see that pattern if you look at the head of a sunflower. Again, if you look at those spirals, there's a particular number of seeds in the spiral if you go one way round, and a different number if you count how many seeds there are if you take the spiral in the other direction. Take those two numbers, divide one by the other, you get 1.62. So there are particular patterns in nature. So although quantum mechanics is showing us how atoms are arranged, sometimes we find that the way things behave on microscopic scales sometimes gives us answers that are similar to how we find some things are arranged in the macroscopic world. And trying to understand why on earth should atoms in a particular alloy arrange themselves in a way that is in some sense similar to the way seeds arrange themselves in a seed head of a sunflower is quite an interesting problem in itself. We're not claiming that quantum mechanics rules sunflowers, it's just that there is some physics there that transcends quantum mechanics versus the macroscopic natural world. This is an artificially coloured image of what happens if you put a lot of atoms in a circle, quite a few of them there, I haven't actually counted them, there were what, 50 or so atoms in a circle, so you end up with individual mountains, the height scale has been exaggerated a little bit, but you can see the mountains of individual atoms arranged in a circle, but what's going on inside the circle? Well, it looks more like the sort of thing you get if you throw a stone into a pond and then you get ripples. It looks like the atoms around the corral here are behaving like particles, but actually what's inside the corral are particles that are behaving, or some, something is behaving like waves, because it looks more like the sort of waves you get of ripples in a pond. So whatever it is we're imaging here, some part of this image is behaving like particles, and a different part of the image is behaving like waves. It comes back to this point that neither the word particle nor the word wave fully explain what it is we're actually observing. We're observing the behaviour of something which sometimes behaves like a particle and sometimes behaves like a wave. And again, that's the difficulty we have with using words to describe these things. A favourite quote. If quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it. We often give this quote to students. We're trying to teach you quantum mechanics. If you think you understand it, then you haven't. You haven't been paying attention. Because if when you try and learn quantum mechanics, it comes up with so many contradictions, not in itself, but contradictions with common sense, then if you're not shocked by some of the results that quantum mechanics gives you, then you really haven't been paying attention and you really haven't taken it all in. But I stick with Einstein's comment, not simply about quantum mechanics, but much more generally. The most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is comprehensible. And it doesn't matter if you take the world to mean the universe, the cosmos, the entire billions of light years, or whether you take the world to mean the Earth, or whether you take the world to mean everything that the Earth is made of, down to the smallest atom or the smallest subatomic particle. What is really amazing is that monkeys that fell out of the trees a few million years ago are capable of understanding the nature of the universe on the largest scales and the nature of the universe on the smallest scales.
I'll finish with this picture. This wasn't taken by me, but it's a very nice picture of atoms. Look at the scale. 850 picometers. Remember, a picometer is one thousandth of a nanometer. A nanometer is one thousandth of a micron. A micron is one thousandth of a millimeter, which is one thousandth of a meter. So this entire image is less than one nanometer on a side, less than one billionth of a meter on a side. And we're seeing individual atoms there. For this particular object, if we imagine how big would a grain of sand be if we were looking at it with this magnification, well, a grain of sand at this magnification would be about the size of the moon. And whenever I see an image of individual atoms, I think about what it is we're looking at. Let's finish with William Blake. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Thank you for listening.